chairs uh, for Torrington. My name is Dr. Charles Fuchs, Charlie Fuchs, and I am the physician in chief of Smilo Cancer Hospital and the director of the Yale Cancer Center. And it's, it's really such a privilege to be able to join you and my colleagues from Torrington. Um, this is you know, really a, a special opportunity to share um, what goes on in our cancer center at Torrington to really help uh, bring to light all the things that we want to bring patients and families an understanding of about cancer care and cancer research. And you know, obviously I want to thank my Debbie Brandt and the entire team at Torrington uh, for making the time to do it. I know we, this is actually a, a busy evening for all of us with a presidential debate later on, but the timing on this is perfect so everyone can both hear the great things going on at Torrington and ultimately uh, move on to whether it's a baseball game or a presidential debate or all of the above. I'm gonna just share my screen. Um, hopefully this works. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it, Charlie. Perfect. So um, I wanna give you all just a brief uh, summary of who we are, what we do, um, and uh, we're all fortunate to be part of uh, a, a major cancer center, a National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. But let me tell you about the history of cancer care and cancer research at Yale. Um, really for a century or more, this, uh, this facility has had uh, a legacy of research, of high profile research in genetics cancer biology, immunology, and other things. Um, a really important event in our history was the passage of the War on Cancer Act, which we'll actually be celebrating soon, its 50th year, of which they created these entities of National Cancer Institute Designated Comprehensive Cancer Centers, of which we were one of the original in 1974, and the only one in the state of Connecticut, which we serve uh, the entire population of Connecticut and beyond. Um, in 2010, another important event was the opening of Smilo Cancer Hospital in New Haven, a 15-story edifice dedicated to cancer care and cancer research. Um, and also with that was sort of the expansion of our, our unique care centers across the state of Connecticut, which I think have brought to the community the expertise, the clinical care and the research that we want to bring to everyone. Uh, an important other date was in 2016 when in New Haven we opened a state-of-the-art Center for Experimental Therapeutics available to all the patients throughout the region who, um, who, are, who have sort of exhausted the available therapies or are looking for new options and want to get access to exciting new drugs coming out of research that we think are transforming uh, the, uh, the care of patients uh, for the better. Today, our cancer center, the Yale Cancer Center, consists of over 450 physician and scientists and 15 care centers, which I'll describe more or across Connecticut and now Rhode Island. Um, as part of our designation, our unique designation by the National Cancer Institute, we have to renew that designation every five years which we've held continuously. Our last renewal in 2018 was really a, an amazing success. Uh, the reviewers actually were very pleased with our progress. Typically, you get a 3% cost of increase, uh, living increase in your budget. And because of the success of all the people on this call and others, we actually were granted a 73% increase, something unprecedented. And to my knowledge, no other cancer center has had such an increase in their funding. The vision of our institution is, as you see here, a world leader in cancer care research and education. Yale Cancer Center and Smilo Cancer Hospital delivers the transformative scientific discoveries and care innovations from Yale University and Yale New Haven Health to bring us closer to a world free of cancer, one patient at a time. And the intent of all this is that we have a broad and important mission but we do that by bringing to bear the talent across the entire enterprise to really transform the landscape globally, but ultimately and most importantly, delivering those innovations to each and every patient that we care for. Our mission 
to provide expert compassionate care, to conduct the full spectrum of cancer research to improve diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and cure, to address and promote public health, disseminate innovation around the world, and train the next generation, generation of leaders in care and research. A key fulcrum of our ability to deliver expert care and innovate are our expertise across each of these domains. Because obviously when, when faced with the diagnosis of cancer, you want to see the expert, whether it be in leukemia, lymphoma, melanoma, lung cancer. And so we have these uh, disease programs embedded throughout our cancer center. All of our faculty and staff are part of these teams. And we want to bring together communities, expert communities, in each of these diseases. So when you go to visit a doctor and a team in Torrington or any of the centers, you are getting expert care specific to the type of cancer that you have. At the same time, as part of what we want to deliver and, and the promise we want for patients is to ensure that the unique discoveries in the labs at Yale, at our cancer center, are moved rapidly, ultimately into clinical trials and into improving the care of patients with new and important therapies. This slide is just a list of clinical trials that were completed and published and reported by members of our faculty in just the past year. Advances in colon cancer, head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, stomach cancer, among other things. Each of these, I will tell you, practice changing and moving the needle for the better for patients. But I think the other really exciting thing is in the red, you'll see four of these have led or will lead this year to new Food and Drug Administration approvals of new therapies for cancer patients in each of these diseases. I mention this because a major cancer center, if they have one of their trials leading to an FDA approval in a year, that's a big deal. And this cancer center, with all the talent we have here, this is an amazing accomplishment. Four, four new, new treatment approvals from Yale, from our cancer center in Smilo in this year. And it's really a credit to the extraordinarily talented and hardworking people that are, that are here at our cancer center. A key component of this is to provide expert destination, state-of-the-art care into the community. That is, no patient in our region should have to travel more than 30 minutes to get that kind of expertise and access to clinical trials. So that's why we have these 15 centers across Connecticut and Rhode Island. All of the doctors there are Yale faculty. All the staff are employed by Yale and Smilo with uniform procedures and access to clinical trials. And as a result today, 48% of every newly diagnosed cancer patient in the state of Connecticut is seen at some point in their care at a Yale Smilo facility. Another key component is to bring clinical trials, new drugs to each of these centers. And in fact, the, most, the, most, the fastest growing component of our clinical research entity enrollments into clinical trials is actually outside of New Haven at our care centers, which now represents 25% of the patients enrolled in clinical trials. Clearly tonight, we're focused on the, the really talented, dedicated individuals who work at our center in Torrington, who service Litchfield County and beyond. You know, we are just so proud of the people who work here um, and really make a difference to bring this kind of expertise, these kinds of resources, and the promise and hope um, to the community. And that's something we want to continue to resource and invest in and make sure that everyone in this region has access to only the finest care because that's what you deserve and you shouldn't have to travel far to get it. This is really unique to as far as major cancer centers go is to deliver this into the community. You know, I think where I would be, uh, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't recognize the times we live in because we're obviously not doing this in person, we're doing it by Zoom and COVID-19 certainly has changed the way we do business in terms of a new normal. But you know, throughout this pandemic, our physicians, nurses, staff in Torrington haven't missed a beat. When I was up there, I was just so impressed of how they were 
committed and steadfast to the mission of great care and research. And I think, what have we done? We've made sure that throughout this time that we continue to provide compassion expert care, that we ensure that the environment that patients come to in Torrington is safe, because obviously we deal with the most vulnerable population in cancer, that our staff are protected, that we expand the capacity to care for COVID patients outside of our cancer center, and that we engage our research investigators and our trainees in terms of the larger mission as we meet this challenge of COVID. So in sum, I think, you know, we've had a great year in the cancer center. We continue to have state-of-the-art clinical care with growing patient volume. Our faculty and staff are recognized as national and international leaders. We have a breadth of research, cancer research, that spans the gamut to really move the needle. We have a growing program of clinical trials. And as you can see, we are leading the development of new therapies. And this is something that's really important for us to deliver to all of you, uh, you know, in, in Torrington and beyond. Um, so uh, I'm stopping my sharing. I just want to thank all of you for attending. I probably extended my time more than I should, but, uh, but I'm just so proud of the work going on here. And I now want to turn it over to Debbie Brandt, the leader and medical director of Smilo Cancer Hospital at Torrington. Uh, Debbie has been a, really a, a pillar of the community in Litchfield County and a leader, and um, we're so proud to have her leading this forum and to lead our center. So Debbie, thank you for allowing me to, to introduce this. Thank you, Charlie. That was great and a wonderful introduction. And thank you everybody who's joined us by Zoom. For those of you who don't use Zoom very often, um, I just want you to know that on the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that says chat. And you can type into that icon any questions that you have. Um, and I will be able to see those questions. And at the uh, end of our discussion, we're gonna open up to really try to answer these questions. So you can feel free to ask questions about cancer, um, about any of the slides, about any of us, about any of the roles and what roles we play in your care. And we're hoping to spend 15 to 20 minutes at the end of our talk, really trying to address those, um, those, those answer those questions. I actually typed in welcome, but it went private. I don't know if somebody else wants to just type in in public. Um, so that every, I'm going to do it to all the panelists and attendees so you guys can see. I'm just typing in a quick welcome message. So who's here on the Zoom? Uh, there are five of us representing our entire office. Myself, Dr. Talsania, Sarah Thoman, who's our nurse practitioner, and two of our wonderful oncology nurses, Abby Hemmingson and Jordan Kane. Uh, Sarah, Abby, and, and Jordan are all originally from this area um, and know a lot of you guys and have grown up uh, with you all. Um, I don't know if you want to go to the next slide. So just as an introduction, I wanted to tell you who we are in Smilo Torrington and how we fit in with Yale. So we integrated with Yale because of all of those things that Dr. Fuchs just told you about in June of 2012. We share patients, we use our local hospital with Charlotte Hungerford, and we use our, the academic hospital of Yale New Haven Hospital. In the cancer center, we have 13 chairs and one bed where patients who need infusions uh, or hydration can, can go. And our office is staffed by four physicians, one nurse practitioner, and a village of other people who help us all take care of you. The benefit of coming here, is, as Dr. Fuchs said, is that you have, we have access to get you on national clinical trials. We have access to specialty tumor boards, so we can always call in and talk to the experts around the state about your particular care and cancer needs. Um, and there's access to support programs. So there's medication assistance funds, there's tobacco cessation, we have genetic counseling, palliative care, and survivorship that helps you all get through the journey of, of cancer, hopefully with um, limited, using your limited economic resources. And this is our picture of your physicians and uh, your nurse practitioner, and I'm going to actually 
turn it over now to Sarah to talk about what she does as a nurse practitioner and take us through the next few slides. Can everybody hear me? We can. Okay, as the nurse practitioner for the Smilo Torrington office, um, I work in collaboration with the physicians here at Smilo. Um, this allows for our patients to be seen um, in a timely manner and get access to care. Um, advanced practice registered nurses are a vital part of our healthcare system here. Um, we are prepared by education and certification, either master's degree or doctora, doctorate level degree. And we have to do continuing education um, in order to become board certified every five years. Um, APRNs, just for people who may not know, are registered nurses who choose to pursue a higher level of education. And this allows for us to assess, diagnose, and manage patient problems. And this can include ordering, performing, and supervising, and interpreting diagnostic and laboratory tests. And we are also able to prescribe medications. Um, unlike physician assistants, which some people are more familiar with, who work directly under the supervision of a, of a physician, APRNs um, are licensed into Dependent practitioners who in Connecticut in certain circumstances can practice autonomously. Here at Smilo Torrington, I work um, in collaboration with our board certified oncologists and hematologists. Um, I help manage possible patient side effects that may come from treatment. I often will see uh, patients in between uh, treatment cycles to help evaluate their lab work and their symptoms and help manage these. And I also have visits with patients um, in order to, what we'll say, clear them for chemotherapy and allow them to receive their treatment for the day. Um, medications that we give here at times can cause reactions. And I also work in our infusion center to help uh, manage these. And I also will um, see sick patient calls if the patients aren't feeling well and they need to be brought into the office for the day. So now I'm going to hand uh, the presentation off to Dr. Telsanya, who's going to talk a little bit more about the, the, the village here at Smilo Torrington, and then she'll discuss a bit about uh, the biology of cancer. Ashida? Can you hear? We can hear you now. Yes. So, uh, so uh, thank you, Sarah. And as we had spoken before, it takes a village to meet our patients and their needs. So we like to work together as a team. And um, so we have the physicians and the APRN who's trained in the oncology and the hematology specialties. Um, we have the oncology certified nurses. These are different than the nurses because these are nurses who are specially trained in taking care of our oncological needs for our patients. We have nurse coordinator is a person who actually helps get the patients um, in as a new referral and helps them navigate through the process. And we have the practice and the infusion nurses. The main difference between these nurses are these are nurses who are trained in giving patients oral and the intravenous chemotherapy. We also have the pharmacist on site and we have technicians who have been trained in taking care of the oncological needs. We have the research staff who help enroll patients on the clinical trials and help them through and navigate through the process. We have the lab technicians. Um, we also have the ambulatory care associates um, and the medical record staff who help us get all the records that's needed in timely fashion. And as mentioned earlier, we have a good supportive care where we have the social workers who help with the psychological and the emotional needs of the patients. We have nutritionists. We have genetic counselor, and we have the palliative care specialist who helps with the symptoms that patients may have during the course of the chemotherapy and help meet with their needs. So again, this is a very good uh, supportive system that our patients have and the needs um, during the time while on treatment and um, following treatment. So this is the amazing staff that we work with, and as many of you may recognize some of them, but this is during Halloween of last year, and we are again approaching that time soon, so um, that's our staff. 
So talking about cancer, um, there are more than 100 different kind of malignant diseases. And um, as one knows, cancer has many different causes. There are some internal and some external causes that factors in. Um, it is characterized by altered self cells. So basically it escapes the normal mechanism or the normal growth regulations, and that basically leads to cancer. So again, cancer can metastasize the, what that I mean is it can spread by way of blood or by lymph glands to different sites in your body. Um, there is a starting place and then it moves to different sites. It can cause different symptoms based on the organ involved and based on where, um, and the symptoms can, patient can have no symptoms or symptoms based on the size or where it localizes. So cancer is an array of different diseases. Um, what we mean is there are different tumors. So if it is a solid tumor, what we mean by it's affecting the solid organs in the body, which includes the colon, which is a colon cancer, gastric is stomach cancer, we have breast cancer and skin cancers. The same applies for lymphatic system. So when the cancer moves to the lymph glands, we have lymphomas, which, um, which are kind of characterized into Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Leukemias are the cancer of the blood cells, and there are, again, variety of leukemias, some the acute leukemias, the chronic leukemias, and we have myeloid leukemias. The same kind of, there is a plasma cell, which is a typical kind of a blood cell. If you have a cancer of the plasma cells, people can have myeloma. And besides cancer, we also treat certain benign blood conditions. So how do we diagnose cancer? And how do we know that a treatment's really working or is effective? So the basic, the gold standard to diagnose a cancer is to biopsy. And the pathologist are the physician who helps us confirm a diagnosis by looking under the microscope and helping us guide as to where this cancer could have originated from. And then the other modalities that we have, that the imaging that we have, which include the CAT scans, PET scans, MRIs, those are other tools which helps us understand as to where the disease is and has it spread to different parts of the bodies. And depending upon the site of the disease, we use different modalities to help us kind of confirm the staging of the cancer. Now, certain kind of cancer, which includes, um, which includes a gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, we may have to use endoscopy to help us, again, stage with the cancer. We have specialized blood tests, which comes into fusion when we're talking about blood cancers. Um, and molecular testing, again, helps us with certain mutation, which is important to know in a cancer, which, again, helps us guide to diagnose as well as to guide with the treatment. So in terms of cancer, the goals of the cancer, now this is a very important aspect of the cancer treatment because as we talked about a little bit about diagnosing and staging, this, that helps us determine what's the goal of the treatment. The goal behind treating your cancer is to help control the disease, is it to help you with curing your disease, or is it to help palliate, palliate being taking care of the symptoms, may it be pain, may it be cough, whatever your symptoms are, we help to take care of the, the palliation part of it. In terms of what are the tools and how do we kind of help you reach to your goals. So based on, on the goals of your care and based on the treatment, either we could use surgery as one of the modalities. Radiation can come into when we are talking about curing or palliating. And then we have systemic treatments, which could be in form of basic hormone treatment. It could be targeted therapies where we talk about mutations. And we have chemotherapies or immunotherapies as relatively new. But as one would have heard, it's kind of making a big save into how we treat cancer, that immunotherapy is a big thing that is helping get a lot of cancers into long-term remission. And sometimes we have to use multiple modalities of treatment in conjunction to help us reach to the goal. And again, how do we define, how do we decide which of the treatment is best for a given patient? So all this answers, the standard treatments that we have for the patient is basically defined on the clinical trials. 
and that helps us get to decide what is the best treatment for a given patient at that given time. So now I'd like to kind of hand off to Dr. Brand to kind of tell us a little bit more about cancer and further treatments. So we discussed before um, that when we meet a patient uh, and we help decide, as Dr. Talsania said, the first question is, how extensive is the cancer? Is it localized in one area or is it spread throughout the body? Can we, is our goal knowing how extensive it is? Is it our goal to cure somebody? Or do we know that we don't have the tools right now to cure somebody, but there are many options to treat them? So how do we make those decisions? So we make those decisions by looking at the literature and knowing what's available and out there. But oftentimes we also present patients who are seen in Torrington to a tumor board the tumor board is a group of physicians made up from different specialties. So usually on a tumor board is a surgeon, the pathologist, a radiation oncologist, and medical oncologists. And together, and a radiologist, and together we review somebody's entire story. And together we decide what stage the patient is, what the goal of treatment is, and what the best treatment to give that patient is. We don't present every patient all the time, but we do present a lot of our patients. We get our patients presented both locally at, uh, at the local tumor board, and we present them at the Yale tumor board. We request the patient's case be reviewed. We upload CAT scans if they haven't been, if they've been done locally and not in the Yale system. We get the pathology slides sent to New Haven so the Pathologists in New Haven can do a second review and make sure that they concur with our local pathologist. And then there are different times uh, that these boards meet and we call in, we zoom in, or if we happen to be on New Haven, in New Haven, we'll actually go to the meetings. Um, so as we alluded to, how do you choose the treatment? You, you choose the treatment based on patients who before you participated in clinical trials so that we understand how the different treatments work and what the goal of the treatment is, it's important to know what the type of the cancer is. So it's important to know where the, treat, where the tumor started. So because if you have tumor in your liver, but it initially started in the breast and, and, and spread from the breast to the liver, we are treating breast cancer, not liver cancer. We need to know the extent of the cancer. What's the stage? Is it stage one and localized or stage three or four and in multiple places? We take into account somebody's age, what their other comorbid illnesses are. We take into account um, the patient's choice. How much treatment do they want to go through? How what's the balance of side effects and what works for them? And we sit down and we talk very frankly with the patient and their family about what's the risk versus the benefit of each option. And that's how we make the decision together as to what the best treatment is. One option for our patients, or often an option, is to participate in a clinical trial. So a clinical trial is saying you have a disease and we're looking to improve the treatment of that disease or we're looking to understand better how to evaluate the disease. And so we do the research to improve outcomes, to improve our knowledge. Often the treatment and the clinical trial will actually help the patient who's participating. Sometimes the patient doesn't get as much benefit, but the knowledge gained will help people in the future. Um, patients are offered participation it is a personal choice. They have to sign consent. They have to understand what they're participating in. And they will know that they are getting certain medications or if they're getting certain medications in combination with a placebo. In cancer research, nobody doesn't get a treatment. It's usually a treatment A versus a treatment B. What's the clinical research process? So before the research actually gets to the patient, there's been a lot of prior research, sometimes in lab animals, often in other patients. 
It goes through an extensive review through the institution, uh, through Yale. There's an organization called the Institutional Review Board that reviews every research trial to make sure it's safe, it's ethical, and it answers a good scientific question. After it gets approved by the Institutional Review Board, it's only then that it comes out to be offered to the patient. It can be a very long process. Sometimes the clinical trials come from uh, drugs and, and through actual pharmaceutical companies. And sometimes they come from cooperative oncology groups that are completely separate from the pharmaceutical companies. There are what we call phases of trials. And so in Torrington, we part our patients locally can participate in phase two and three trials, and, uh, but we can't, we can't participate in phase one trials locally. So phase one trials, patients go to New Haven. These are trials where you might be the very first patient to receive a drug. Maybe we don't understand what the appropriate dosing is. And those trials require an ex extraordinary amount of focus and care. Phase two trials is once we know, we have a general idea of when the, the drug is safe and we think it has activity in a particular disease, then we look for usually about 30 to 60 patients to make sure that that drug is safe and it looks like it has activity in that disease. And generally phase three trials are when we're looking at uh, a new treatment versus a standard treatment. Um, so you should always ask your oncologist if there is a clinical trial for you. Being in a clinical trial is safe. The risks are very clearly outlined. You are not treated like an animal or a guinea pig. You are treated very much like a human being. And study after study actually shows that patients who participate in clinical research actually get often uh, better care and do as well, if not better, than people who do not participate in clinical research. And all of us here are, are very, um, involved. We care very much that clinical research uh, exists in our practice and that we want to participate in making cancer better for our patients and for the future patients. And the only way we're going to do that is with clinical research. Um, cancer management in these unusual times. As Dr. Fuchs mentioned, and as everybody knows, we're living in a pandemic. Um, and so that has very much changed the way we practice. So we do telehealth visits, which are very much like these Zoom visits, except we can actually see you and talk back to back or like FaceTiming. And that, those have been actually really helpful. And um, that's, those are visits that I think are going to stay way beyond the pandemic. Some people don't really need to come in. We just need to touch base. And it's a good way to touch base with having, without having to come in. You may have noticed that you get a pre-screening phone call to make sure to check that you haven't been at exposed to COVID and to lessen your risk. And we do a second screen when you get here to make sure your temperature is okay and that we're not worried that maybe you've contracted COVID and not realized it. And we're doing that to keep other patients safe as well as our staff, staff, staff safe. We are, everybody has to wear a mask. We have personal protective equipment that we use here. We're doing our best to social distance and separate people out, limiting people in the waiting room allowing some visitors, but only having them come into the exam rooms as opposed to waiting in the waiting room. We have a full-time um, person who cleans everything in between use. So we've always just sort of changed the paper and gently wiped things down. Now everything is completely disinfected in the room before another patient comes in. The bathrooms are disinfected after each use. We have testing available for both staff and patients when we feel it's needed. The, the, hot, the COVID hotline uh, is down at the bottom if any of you need it, and you can always call and ask us for assistance if you um, feel that you have COVID or have any questions. So we're now going to move uh, this seminar conference into trying to answer questions that you have for us about the way we practice or any of the slides. Um, I haven't seen anybody uh, put anything in the chat box yet, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to actually ask both Abby and Jordan. So can you guys comment about 
what you do day to day, what being an oncology nurse is like, and maybe give a little more detail about what a practice nurse versus an infusion nurse is. Um, so it's, uh, this is Jordan. Uh, I'll be representing the nursing staff as of today. I'm an infusion nurse um, in the Torrington office. So I deal mainly with patients getting intravenous um, cancer treatments and some get cancer treatments and oral chemotherapy and the practice nurses um, mainly handle the oral chemotherapy side of things. So we collaborate a lot um, in terms of patients that are getting both. Um, day to day we assess our patients of course they're cleared by the physician or they just come down to see a nurse um, we assess their labs see how they're doing um, and infuse their chemotherapy two nurses verify the chemotherapy in the computer we check the orders based on based on the physician's orders um, and there's some math calculations that we do as well and then we um, verify again at the chair side um, after the medication is made in the pharmacy on site. Um, so we're assessing the patients, making sure they're tolerating their treatment well, that it's being infused safely, giving um, any education based on how to manage uh, side effects as effectively as possible as you're undergoing the treatments. And we're also available for questions if perhaps somebody is not in the infusion center that day and they're not feeling well or just have a question, um, concerns related to their treatment were available as well and we welcome any and all questions, of course. So can you tell us a little bit about how your training might be different than other nurses? You know, what sort of pushed you to be an oncology nurse and what's different about being an oncology nurse than a, a different kind of nurse, a nurse that doesn't do oncology? Sure. Um, there's additional training um, with regards to hanging chemotherapy. We have to go through specialized courses and specialized classes to learn about the different drugs and how to safely handle them and safely administer them and what they what they do and how they work in the body to uh, eradicate the cancer or control the cancer. So there is an additional certification. Um, you can become an oncology certified nurse, meaning that you have the latest and greatest and most up-to-date knowledge and that you have an additional certification um, to specialize in the oncology area. Um, everybody has their own basic, everybody has their own story on why they, why they became an oncology nurse. Cancer is such an overreaching illness that it affects so many people in our culture and our society. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody that doesn't know someone that is affected by cancer. Um, so that's a big push and a big drive. For me, uh, the, it kind of worked in both sides of my brain, the very scientific, it, scientific exact, analytical part of my brain loves the sciency research and it's always changing and it's always growing and we're always learning more and that's so cool um, and then there's the other side that's managing symptoms and helping with disease management and we have an abby um, <laughs> so i'm gonna scooch over while i'm talking so palliating symptoms and giving people the best quality of life possible um, is so important to me too. And I think you get to live in both worlds as an oncology nurse. And I think that's my favorite thing about it. Okay. I just gave the secret of life. You missed it. Oh man. <laughs> so Abby, maybe you could help us. One of the other questions here is, um, what's the benefit of having the lab services in the office and, um, you know, what, what can we do in our lab and things like that? And how does that help you with nursing kind of getting the lab so quickly? I'll put my mask on so I'm sure. <laughs> um, as far as having a lab on site, I think it makes a huge difference for patient care because we can uh, get information immediately and address it if it's needed. Um, and, you know, for patient safety, it's huge because we will know in real time if it's safe to administer uh, these medications that can affect different body systems like you know our kidneys our liver 
and our bone marrow. Um, so I find it hugely beneficial. And it's also beneficial to be attached to Yale because sometimes we need to send things for more information and we can send them right out. Can you guys also share how you work with the nutritionist and how, how, that, how a nutritionist can really help our patients? And well, we're learning more and more um, with supportive care for cancer over time um, about what helps patients while they're on chemotherapy. And over time, we've learned that uh, having a good nutritional status or maintaining our nutrition while we're on chemotherapy can directly affect some of the side effects that we're experiencing uh, for patients or how well they feel while they're on treatment. Having a nutritionist available to our patients really you know, can help with a great number of the side effects that they will experience while they're on treatment and make a huge improvement in how they're feeling well on treatment. It's just another piece of the supportive care that we can offer our patients um, to make their experiences more positive with chemotherapy. That's great. Actually, it's very timely. So one of the questions that just came over is someone who's going to be starting treatment here uh, in the next couple of weeks and sort of asking, you know, what, what do I have to expect? What, should, what do I have to be prepared for? So maybe you guys want to talk a little bit about nursing education because I actually think that's a really unique thing that we do here that not every place does. So I will say in Torrington, in addition to meeting with the physicians and us spending time talking about what potential side effects are, uh, we offer every patient the benefit of meeting with the nurses before their treatment um, starts so that they can have a specific time to just talk about side effects on without it being mixed in with the rest of the appointment. So you want to talk about how nursing sets aside time and, and really does that counseling? So what we try to do um, whenever possible is to have a dedicated teaching visit, whether it be um, via the telephone or in person to do just that. You get a, you get a nurse in front of you and we go over we go over the treatment, we go over the drugs that you're going to get, um, whether it be the actual chemotherapy or the pre-medications or drugs that we give to help uh, reduce side effects or reduce risk of reaction. And we also do an assessment at the same time because we wanna get to know you a little bit better um, and what your needs are going to be going forward and what comorbidities are you coming to the table with and any concerns that you might have. Um, we always say it's the first time you get to ask questions. It's not the last and it's not the first last time you get to hear the information, just the first. The more times our brains get us exposed to information, the better we are at retaining it. So rather than dumping all the information on you at once, uh, we try to break it up and give you a little exposure before before you're there, if at all possible. And also, if we're doing it during the infusion visit, we set aside, that's why you're going to be there the better part of the day, and go through the chemotherapies and go through the treatments as we're doing it, review it at the end, write it all down for you, and give you the resources that you'll need to be as successful as possible. Well, I, I think a, a, another important piece is when people are initially diagnosed, a lot of times there's a lot of anxiety, um, understandably. Uh, and I think it also offers some validation about feelings because um, people tend to come into the, the first even teach visit being fairly anxious. Um, and I always tell patients, you know, for your first treatment, make sure you bring something good to eat from mm -hmm. home because we have kind of limited snack options. Um, we have the Netflix, we're lucky enough to have the Netflix donated here so that people can have some movie entertainment. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think that the first couple treatments are quite anxiety provoking because, um, you know, you don't know how you're going to feel. We can go over potential side effects, but it, you know, the long and the short is we can't, we don't hold a crystal ball. Um, but, you know, it's very normal to be anxious for the first treatment and on yeah. the first treatment. I would agree. 
Uh, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about how we use social work services to sort of help with our patients' needs and how beneficial it is to have the social worker? I think you're muted, though. Hello? Okay, so we're very fortunate that we're able to have a licensed clinical social worker here um, on our campus several days a week. And even when she's not here, she's available to patients, you know, via phone or, or telehealth. Um, like, like the nurses were talking about, people have anxiety, people have, um, you know, financial burdens. There's lots of different things that cancer affects. It's not, it's not just you. It might be, you know, your loved ones, everything. So having the social worker being available um, to help provide more resources um, really is is helpful I would I would agree I think it's an it's been an enormous help for for patients to have those additional resources and if the social worker herself can't provide them she knows the systems in the in the community to help people reach out or larger uh, national societies to help find funding as well um, does anybody have any additional comments they want to say before we close out the evening? Dr. Talsania, anything else you want to share? I think one more thing I had to was the genetic counseling. So as we have the genetic counselor, they are um, available out of Yale New Haven, but to make it available for our patients, we actually have a way of telehealth where the patient can actually be meeting with them while in Torrington and having the services that you know you can get uh, from them being in New Haven. So I think that's an excellent resource given the new stuff that we are finding about and with the hereditary component to the cancer that I feel we have the experts available to help us and decide what's the best kind of testing that's needed for a particular set of family. Um, and I think that's right available on the footsteps. So that's one more extra thing I think we three have. And I think this is actually a great closing. There's a patient who's uh, watching us from Florida who states that he's a former patient and he just wanted to thank all of us for uh, taking such good care of him. And um, I recognize him as one of my patients, so I appreciate that he's reaching out and it's nice to see his name uh, coming up on the Zoom chat. Um, so I hope that everybody found this really helpful. We tried to take a topic that was very general I think the concept of cancer just as an entity is very difficult to understand. How does one cell figure out how to grow, not die like it's supposed to, spread out through the tumor wall and go to other parts of the body? And why does it matter if it's in your liver that it, where it comes from to begin with? Like, why is that important? And for those of us who don't do oncology all the time, I can see why you it doesn't really make any sense. So I think it's really important to take a step back and really sort of understand the biology of cancer and that there are um, a lot of different types of cancers and to understand the process of what we as your care team look at to help try to create what really is in your best interest to care for you as an individual and your patient. And that we do take into account not just the cancer, but who you are, what other things are going on in your life, what other things are going on in your body, what other medicines are you taking, you're taking. So we are gonna end, because we do wanna all get home to eat dinner. Um, I'm supposed to remind you that you can call the office at any time with questions. You can also go for additional, just general information to canceranswers at yale.edu and yalecancercenter.org. Um, thank you guys all so much for joining us. I hope you found it helpful and we're thinking we're going to potentially do more of these. So if you want to send us a note to let us know what was good, what wasn't so great, um, that would be awesome so we can make this better. Um, so we're going to say good night and stay dry because those of us who are still in Connecticut and Torrington, it's pouring. And thank, all, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you.